All right. So let's get let's continue our discussion on or initial exercise on just like getting ourselves oriented with an example image in image J. Again, we're going to use image J because in terms of functionality, it has a lot of image processing routines already built in, possibly too many. It's a free software, so it possibly has three versions of some algorithm that you're interested in, uh, though none of them possibly works precisely as you would want it to, but <laughs> that's, a, that's an option out there. But some of them work really well, and it has been um, sort of, I don't know that there is a standard in digital rocks petrophysics, but it's sort of a semi-standard that everybody knows. All of these routines in some shape or form probably exist in other programming environments. So you can probably pieces of them uh, find in uh, MATLAB. It's a specific toolbox in MATLAB, image processing math, uh, toolbox. The UT does have access to it. Or um, Python, but Python again is a free software, so it has these different types of projects everywhere, uh, and people are sort of continuously uh, uploading their codes to either uh, GitHub with Py like Python codes or to MATLAB has a central uh, MATLAB exchange. So that's places to look for if you're interested in a specific routine and possibly automating um, the what we we're working on better. But we will comment comment on some automation even within ImageJ. So without further ado, uh, let's open up that same image because we're going to continue it. Uh, before we, there was that exercise one note here in the slides that we went over last time. So this is going to be part of the homework. So uh, and homework will be sort of like put together the snapshots in um uh, in a PowerPoint, and that's what you're going to send okay, as a homework. So that, that part should be, so just pay attention to these blue things, um, pay attention to assignments, and prepare exercise solutions. And there is actually a slide that is dedicated, though some of it we will work on in class. So let me just, I will actually go back to the software itself and open it up. Oops, oh, come on. And I will load the same image. So this is again import image sequence. Uh, you will most most of the time work with image sequence or a raw image, and sometimes there's all like there's this is again what it means to be a free software. There's this entire list of everything and everything. And if you come up with a new format, you can add a plugin that adds one more on the list. Okay. So because of that freedom, you can always, um, you can, these lists are possibly slightly hard to manage. Image sequence. That's the one. Click on the first one. And I want to so all 106 slices have been uploaded um, this is what was called slice 001 on the on the in the folder so also this tells you what is the memory you're using that can be important 16 megabyte this is 8 bit image and you can change the type uh, in image type okay so you can convert this and output in any other type if you'd like though if something started as an 8-bit then outputting it as 32-bit is a waste of memory unless whatever algorithm you're about to use needs 32 bits okay? uh, or rather needs a floating point okay? so in that case that might become important so types are important depending on what is the application you're going to use after this Okay, so that's a quick intro, and I hope you remember you can 
slide through back and forth. So I'm not, not going to uh, review all of the visual inspection we have already done. Uh, orthogonal views, uh, plotting a profile. Uh, what we will actually move on to is selecting a region of interest. So you already possibly has played with this. There's a little uh, rectangle area with uh, some tools. Area selection tools are the first four. Most commonly something like oval or circle or a rectangle. Is, that's what for any kind of algorithm afterwards is more useful. Or you can kind of draw a polygon. Um, now, line selection tool is something that we used when we were plotting a profile. So you have to have that line first, and then you can plot what the values, uh, interpolated values are along that line. Okay? And then there's all others. There's angle tool. For those of you who have the images that you would like to, for instance, measure contact angles in these projections. So beware that it is a projection <laughs> if you're using this angle tool in 2D. Um, point tool, van, and so forth. You can add text. Um, you can magnify things. <clears throat> you can play with all of these yourself. LUT is what changes that uh, sort of lookup table and how image looks like. Most commonly, I really mostly use area selection um, and line selection. I annotate with text and I bring things to PowerPoint and that's why I edit them too, as I please. Right? Uh, but then again, it, it's still an option. So as you're creating images for uh, publication, it might be very useful. Right. So let's play with resizing. I would like you to... Basically, select a region of interest. Okay, so select this little tool. There is a rectangle, and you can play within any slice of this. And later on, you can apply it to all of the slices. So that part is really useful when you're working with a stack. So this is a stack of slices. So. I would work on a copy though. So before you do anything, just duplicate the image. If you go to image and duplicate, if you forgot where it's, at, where it's at, there's that little search area where you can type in duplicate. And as you select this region, you can basically click around and select. There will be an information on this starting position for your, uh, that's typically this point right here. And note that you're in slice 38 if the counting starts from one, but this position is referred to as 37 which, because it starts from zero. This is something that commonly shows up so all of the positions here start from zero okay so this is the position where your rectangle started and then its width and height is noted here and this is the ratio between the two now do yourself a favor when you're resizing if you can resize to the same height and width and we will see why later but basically because of that packing structure of how we pack arrays into a three-dimensional array then the only thing they might be flipped but there will be no data corruption if you read them in the wrong way right so things might show what is x might show as y what is y might show as x if you make a mistake but you will not lose the <laughs> information and create issues. So if your analysis, whenever you're analyzing, allows for the same size and nothing really changes dramatically with the same size, go with the same size in X and Y. Just make it simpler, simpler to remember too. Okay. But you might want to maximize your region or whatever to capture certain bugs, then that might warrant different. 
And then you can do crop. So if you go to image, you can crop, you can basically cut down your entire image to this, and then it becomes 250 by 250 by 136. And you can do that for the entire stack. Yeah. Can you do that? I will go and do it as well. And then I want you to, so I would like you to plot histogram both for the original image. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. Both for the original image and for this cropped region. Wrong selection. So I have two versions. So if you remember histogram, it's in analyze, control H, click on it, control H, yes, okay. This was the histogram of the large image. Now if I resize, I'm trying to hit the same size, which is difficult with my mouse. And I'll show you another way to control this, but for now it doesn't matter. I'm just going to go with, the, with this. You might want to actually also walk yourself through and inspect whether your chosen rectangle, what fits into it through all of the slices. That visual inspection is important. Sometimes the image actually, so remember that this is an image of something that sits in the CT. Sometimes it's ever so slightly tilted. And then you get this very annoying misalignment between the slices and by cutting through the middle, you might want to, you might still want to correct for that, right? And uh, move things around, but it is, and you will see whether you have an issue if you kind of walk through all of the slices. I, so where was I? I think I lost my sub-selection while talking. I'm just gonna, so image crop. Oh, do you see what happened here? It's jumped to the last slice, but that's not the problem. So you, what you want to make sure is that it, you do have all of the slices when you crop, because it could actually crop just one image. Okay, let's do a click on it, and then I analyze histogram. These are my two histograms. What is obviously different? The count should be different. They're different sized images. So, hmm? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the gray. This is how I know that this is the gray. Remember that I mentioned that this is artificial? It's single value. Nothing ever that comes from CT will have precisely that value. There will be some spread around it. Okay, because of noise. So it's artificially put in number, and if you want to avoid it, this is one way is to crop inside and check the histogram, and that basically tells you, aha, uh -huh, so I cut that up. Well, it's cut out. It's not in the histogram anymore. So you want to be careful not to have that value as part of your report if you're doing the report. If you do the SPW <laughs> presentation, please don't. Uh, put artificial stuff in your report. So that's something too. Now, you can also now save this image. Um, where's my... You can save the histogram. I think I pointed it out that you can, uh, you can look at the list and save this as a text file that you can process anywhere else. 
but you can also also note that whatever you're saving has to be clicked on so then save as and then you can save this as any type of Im any type of other image type so we imported it as a sequence right you can our output uh, output is avi or gif so if you do a gif it's animated gif it's going to be a little video that you can slide through or input in your presentation and so forth which is helpful okay. so that's any output type basically works though for three-dimensional images we will often use uh, volumetric types okay. all right all right so let's now fit an oval to this entire round shape and before we do that, I'd like you to, to actually employ a macro. So go to Plugins, New Macro. Uh, uh, plugins, Macro, and Record. So that will show commands we're clicking on, which is very useful if you want to automate this and repeat it later and execute as a script. Okay. So basically, you want to go to Plugins, Macro, and Record for now. And that will show commands of what it is that you're doing as you go. Okay. It's sometimes called a trace, sometimes called record. A lot of software at this point should have it. Okay, Especially if they're what I call clickables. They have GUIs and uh, you, you're allowed to click and select. Well, any <laughs> click is actually clicking on a location and you want that location often for various practical purposes if you want to repeat things later and every click and executable like there is every button has a function it runs below and it typically collects information from the user that it gives to that function right and that's precisely what you want to automate you want to run that function with certain inputs that you have typed in as you go and some of that input might be a location information from the click, uh, but nevertheless, so let's fit an oval. I'm going to do another control, control D, oh. duplicate. Control shift D is the shortcut on my computer. Okay. So this is the second. So now I'm gonna fit an oh, up. Now I'm gonna first record. We're looking for record macro. That's the first one here. So now just put it on a side and monitor kind of what happens. So as I click on this, it said, oh, it, you set tool to oval. And now I'm going to start to fit this to my image. And as I do, you will see how it actually changes here. And you can see whether you're actually circular. This width, height and width should be the same if you're proper circle. Otherwise, it's some sort of an ellipse. Yes, that's the whole point of recording it because you can type in this and execute it. So that's on those slides. So that's part of what I'm... But sometimes you just want to play with it, uh, depending which mouse we you have. <laughs> you might not want to play with it. I'm working now with the, uh, only my laptop mouse, so that can be a little bit ever so slightly annoying. So now I can walk through also and see how that oval fits. It's not the best fit here. I would like three, four. Uh, now it's too big. Oh, well. 
353. So it's not perfect, it's one voxel off. It's like an oval with two axes, right? I'm just gonna leave it like that, this exercise. I'm not gonna butcher it with this mouse. But the only problem is like this recorder, for better or worse, records every click. So you want to edit it at the end, like the winners, right? You play, you got it to where you want it to be. Then you delete all of the attempts before, essentially. So that's something to think about. Okay, so let's say that this is an oval. It fits rather well. If I now go to so-called clear outside, option in edit. It's going to simply internally ignore or set something to the value that it internally ignores. So you can think about it as a masking type of operation within image J. And I'm going to say yes. So now this is this cleared value. It's, it's a value zero for operate. But when I actually analyze histogram, it's not going to show up anymore. Let's actually check the list for zero. Yes, so zero is only four counts, so it didn't count all of the zeros that are outside. Okay. Even though zero is a, it's a perfectly fine value to be found somewhere inside this oval, and I have four of them apparently. Okay. These zeros, it's showing the outside as a zero, but that's why it's like it's an internal operation to image J or Fiji, where it knows it has some sort of masking procedure within to ignore that outside. And then your histogram shows what it should show. This masking is a common way of dealing, like especially since most of the cores are cylindrical, images come in rectangular, right? Arrays, so you always have to find a way to ignore these regions. And you can also see it simply basically processes this as setting the background color, and that's how it knows about it. You can, of course, set the background color to your favorite shade of blue or orange. We know how RGB colors work. If no, if you do, if you want to find the mix, you can look for RGB for burnt orange <laughs> and then set that as a background color. And you can run clear outside the stack and run histogram on the stack. So this is actually what it actually runs. Okay, So it has a run command that goes and executes function called histogram. And that function has an input set to stack. If it's just one image, then probably there's no that input and then it has default behavior. Questions? This macro, it's a text file. Okay. You can also save it. So you can create something under name. It uses internally IGM, IJM to know that this is image J macro. You can change this to a name, save it. For, so you can also create it like this. So I could also remove all of the garbage. This is where I could also say, hey, <laughs> make this a circle. <laughs> then let's click on this one, maybe. Let's see if I'm going to say. So if I click on this and say run, it has executed it automatically on that. Now I messed up the original, but I can always read it in again. I did precisely what I say, what I said you shouldn't do. <laughs> Your original copy. Let's actually, haha, red, green, 
blue. Let's do, let's mix red, red and green. Ah, uh, no, it's still actually didn't take effect because this is an 8-bit image. So just set it to some sort of gray value. Interesting. So this background color did not fully take effect because my image is, and the value, it took 100. And that's what it set it to. Is everybody following what I'm talking about? It says set, set background color. Typically, this is red, green, and blue for setting background color. But this image is not a color image. So it basically just took the middle one and went with 100, 100, 100, which is, or 100, which is just the value of one grayscale. So now this is gray. If I want it to be white, apparently I need to put 255. Not completely white. Now it, it's interpolated. Look at that. Unknown behavior. <laughs> Set this to a design color when it's 8-bit image that is not color in itself. And excuse me, but I'm a researcher, so I'm going to research now what is going to happen if I change this to a RGB stack. Okay. okay, so I'm going to change it to a type that allows for color. Okay, so the change has happened here, and you don't visibly see a change until you actually save this as an image, and then it's three times larger than you actually originally had it. So let's try it now. See? Now I'm burnt orange. You know, give burnt orange space. Hmm? I know it's close to 200. I've, I've done this before. I've colored images before. Um, most often, though, so sometimes I just do it for kicks. Um, most often, though, it's not the best of the colors for outputting. I'm typically busy choosing good colors for surfaces. And surfaces have shading. Lighter colors work better. So this is too dark because it doesn't show. I've been in situations where you show up with a PowerPoint. You, have, you made these really cool images and they show too dark or the, this or that. So if you want or they print too dark if you put them in a paper and whatever. So lighter colors are better. So for lighter color behavior, we would, I would probably put, put something like, just make lighter, uh, so white is 250, 250, 250, 255, 255, 255. So make this more lighter, basically turn it more to the white side, which is 255. Darker is closer to zero. Um, so essentially let's try with 100%. So this should be some sort of softer if, See, and this, oh, wow. And then I colored part of the histogram because that's what was selected. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, this is getting artistic, everyone. <laughs> so, so if you process your histogram, this is what you get. It's an image, so it worked with it, okay? Okay, let's run this. All right. So this is a lighter color. It's not my favorite color actually anymore, but it actually is probably good for shading. It shows rather well. This yellow, mustard yellow, huh? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, you expect to have the same results if nothing has changed. Like I changed the type of this image. Wow, okay. Um, there's nothing here that changes the values other than the setting this background color. Now we're talking about the change from like your manual application of the thing? Did anybody else have that issue? So that means essentially that some change to the image has happened. 
Now, I don't know whether you clicked on something, so try with two very fresh copies. Import it again, copy it twice, and do the same. One manual, one you redo the. Um, if you made the change, like I changed here from 2354 to 353, now my region is slightly different size, but that would be extremely hard to spot visually. The difference between this oval being 354, 353, as opposed to 353, 353, right? So this is a smaller oval, 353, 353. Its area is smaller than 354, 353. What's the area of ellipse? A, B, A times B times B, pi, right? So the area of this oval is 354 times 353 times P, as opposed to 353 times 353 times P. So it's 353 voxel, uh, pixels per slice that it differs, I think. Yeah? No. But whatever is the difference between. Yeah? Do the math on the piece of paper. <laughs> so there's a difference in number of voxels, and then you multiply that by 136. And that's the how many different pixels we have now, or slash voxels we have sampled in the histogram. Yeah. But yes, some change has happened. Now, I, ha I can tell you that this is what I have found during the using of imagery. The Different algorithms, especially as we move on further and you go through much more involved steps of what happens. Some of these algorithms, for instance, need what's called a sealed volume. And then they internally, before the algorithm, as the algorithm runs, it basically puts, it in, puts your entire image in a box that seals things with zero on a side, for instance. And then from then on, your image that you're looking at is essentially changed. It has that layer of zeros on the side. It has walls, added walls. And if you go and save it, that's going to show up, right? I'm guessing that this value here shows up now as a zero, whether you like it or not. And some other software will not know that that's this cleared must area that clear outside function in image J has done. Do you see? It became a number, and that number then transfers. You go to MATLAB, it's just going to interpret it as a number zero. And then sometimes it's a simple fix. You just want to change that zero to something else. You know, find if this and this is zero, change it to whatever works in MATLAB. <laughs> sometimes you want to go back to image J and change that zero to a better value because that value somehow better serves you, depending on what are you computing here, right? So that be, be sensitive to that. Image is changing as you're clicking on things. And then if you save it and read it in somewhere else, it might have slightly different interpretations. Based on that. I have, I'm now forgetting where, but there was this very annoying, this box is imprinted in my memory because it placed the box and until I actually output it, and then I removed it manually in MATLAB, actually. Like, I went to all of the <laughs> sites and just removed them um, so I could move on. I could not find how to disable that in image J. But that said, you could crop it, of course, to the middle. But I was just like, how do I disable this as an option? And there was no ability. It's somebody put in, put in a piece of software that works in a certain way. That's it. You can always, it is an open source software, so you can always dig in as too. As, as, as deep as you feel, <laughs> you can dig in. Okay. Any other questions? Everybody okay? Are you bored with me talking, talking, talking? Hope not. <clears throat> Again, macro is very useful. I had to train myself. Well, to this day, I have to remember, especially when I get into a new image that I want to look at, I get excited, I get in, and then I start clicking and making choices in that forget which choices I made. And you move away and you don't have the information anymore where your rectangle was or whatever selection. Have that macro running in the background, even if you just dis discard it all at the end, right? so that you know how to backtrack where those choices are. 
Uh, you can again choose your uh, image J s suggests IG, IJM. You can choose whatever and then you'd like. It's a text file. All right. So for your homework, please do naming convection for files. Homework, image types, and your last name and first name. You can just do PowerPoint. And I'd like results of exercises one, two, and three. But three we will actually work on in class. So I just wanted you to basically add a histogram to this report. Just that everybody knows how to capture image on your from your computer snipping. snipping tool. The new one is Snip and Sketch. But yeah. everybody knows Snip and Sketch? If you don't know, type in Snip and run it. The snipping tool will apparently be outdated. So just grab that and put it in. <clears throat> you can save it from ImageJ as well, but that way you can possibly grab multiple things into one. Done with it. Okay, so what I would like you to compute for exercise two is do a compute, uh, computing porosity profile, and there is all of the information here what you need to do. You need to go to a specific project on Digital Rocks portal. There is multiple pairs. These are from, some of you know, Hassan Khan. These are images from um, his PhD work. And you pick a pair. I don't care, of buggy images before and after invasion with particulates, okay? And then for those two pair, compare their profiles and just let us know which, which ones you've done. And do record the macro, so I'd like snapshot of that macro, then it's easier to <laughs> see what you've done. Clean up anything that is extra, right? And I want you to process images to disregard the air background around them and compute pro, uh, and compare porosity profile. This is a raw image. So there is, we will actually go to the importing a raw image in the next exercise, but there is actually how to do everything here. And then one assumption that we are making is that wherever you see 255, which is white, that's glass, fully glass, okay? So we're assuming that's 0% porosity. That's an assumption to be made in processing these images. And zero is air, which is 100% porous pixel, right? And in between is something in between that is partially, we, we are not, these are not the fully resolved images, so there, there's partial volume effects in there. And then basically to, you can do math. This is an awesome macro. You can just manipulate an entire stack in the same way and all we are saying is scale this gray value divided by the two for 156 and multiply times 100%. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going to take as a porosity. That's it. Right? So it's sort of a mass and you can process any image like that. And then do a Z profile to compare initial and flooded image. Okay. So that's going to be. What we're going to do here now as an exercise is reading the data. Um, so go to this. Slides are posted for you. So you go to. <clears throat> no. I am not communicating here. Yes. Okay. <coughs> so this is the image. This is that animated GIF, by the way, through the stack, and it's output from image J. So you want to download. <coughs> Oh, 
opening directly here it asks you if you want to open directly even if you uh, if you specify image j it's a very good question yeah you don't support the format bye <laughs> So now I will go to my image J. I will close up all kinds of things here. simply to clear my space. Oops, I closed the recorder though, that's a bad idea. I was histogramming a lot this class, look at that. That's my favorite though. Histogram with a sunset or something. Okay, here we go. So now you will have to import raw. This is a binary image. It didn't download. Okay, let's try this again. Down on the file. Save. There we go. This is two hundred and fifty fifty six megabytes. Shouldn't take too long. Now, image type, 16-bit unsigned. Six hundred and thirty, four hundred and ten. This is all, but <clears throat> click little Indian. This is how our bytes process from left to right or right, right to left, and you don't want to mess that up. And 16 bit means that I'm using two bytes per number. Okay. Let's see if this is it. Okay, great. Uh, I did not give it enough images, did I? I don't think I. Five hundred and ten. I read in one, <laughs> which is okay. It's read in that first one correctly. All right. This is an oil blob. Give that angle tool a shot in measuring contact angle here. In a projection, of course. Okay. So it's a bunch of ketten, limestone. They're kind of very old. They're oval. You can see some microporosity within some of them. Yeah. This is water. This is oil. Yes? In a few pores. Now, let's mess this up. So I'm asking you and you can grab images. So try all of the, so <clears throat> this is D version. So it's an unsigned 16 bit little Indian with correct image dimensions. So I want you to do the same thing, just vary things. What if you assume it's a 16 bit big Indian, 16 bit unsigned big Indian. So just read it in four times, okay? Let's see what happens. So this is what it what it is. 
import wrong. Good news is it's going to remember everything from before. I'm just going to now change here to 16 bit signed and let's say leave little Indian. Okay, so this is little Indian that's signed. Okay, so this is that misinterpreted that first bit. Okay, that is now instead of sign, it's taken for a sign. And suddenly your range is not from zero to 65,000 anymore. It's from negative something. The first bit, instead of being a number, is just saying, oh, this is plus or minus. And then things are randomly plus or minus, right? Large numbers are suddenly negative, right? You can see some semblance to the image, but it's a scramble. And most of the time, it's actually just garbage. Right? As you walk around, you see suddenly these negative values, minus 32,000. Yeah. So that's still having correct byte order. Now let's mess up byte order. Import, raw. So I'm gonna say it's a 16 bit signed and it's gonna be big Indian if I unclick this, right? So now I'm reading every byte in a reverse order than it was written. And talking about scramble, this should be a super scramble. This is almost art. It's not a limestone. <laughs> this could be interpreted as <laughs> entirely different porous medium. I don't know what it would be. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Mudstone suddenly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now let's do the final one. So this one is like I messed up everything, both the signing and the byte order. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do okay. It's 16 bit unsigned, but I'm gonna mess up the byte order. And it's very similar to this mess. I didn't do much. It's just as I walk around, all of these are. Now again, one way to make art in this digital world would be then to change this type to RGB color and change some color schemes. <laughs> Have fun with it. So I want you to capture all of these and give me. You can then immediately say, if see, if you mess up byte order, you're getting scrambled that nothing is recogni recognizable, right? This is a slight change. Now, oh, let's do one more. So let's do incorrect. Import row. Okay. So now I'm going to do everything correctly as it should be. I'm just going to flip height and width. You will see these bands because as you go, Every time you're making the same sort of type of a mistake, instead of 410, you're reading 630. So you reach into the second one, and then you do the same, and that's how banding happens through the image. Right? Does that make sense? Because they were stored row by row, and now you're reading it column by column or the other way around. So that's what this flipping... And this is what I said, like, if, if this image was actually stored as 410 by 410, all you would flip is really that this shows up 
like whatever is x is y and whatever is y is x, but it, it shows up correctly, actually. And for porous medium, it actually orientation is relative anyway, or arbitrary. So if you save things with the same <laughs> width and height, then you sometimes save yourself trouble, especially at this. There is an option to save this, save as a volumetric teth. I think this one will correctly save it as teth. Um, let's see. And then things are good because volumetric teth Um, should actually incorporate all of this information in and read in. It's a format, so it will. It should read everything correctly, but it's not always supported. So that's the. It should become increasingly supported. So if you want to pack everything else, and then a lot of people opt to uh, do a stack of slices, but then suddenly you have, in this case, 510 files in a folder. That's a mess to look at. And if you expect to read all of them and do something with it, then it's better not to go slice by slice. Okay, questions? So again, uh, do snapshots and do the histograms and see where the, for all of these. So let me wait for you to finish those histograms so you have this exercise three done. <clears throat> Oh, and I'm asking for one more. Do it as 8-bit, just for kicks. I'll do it too. A different type of art. <laughs> so do histograms for all of these. So what is the mistake that I didn't do is do record, I hope. That you did it. There's macros and record.
while I'm waiting for you, I'm going to create a canvas assignment for this. Monday is fine, but there's not much to it. We did one and three in class, <laughs> quickly finish it, but I'll do uh, one week. More options. Submission, I'll do online. And file uploads. You can do PDF or PPTX. I'm going to add a bo bonus challenge, optional. So bonus challenge, create a script in another favorite environmental environment MATLAB or Python, if you'd like. Challenge yourself and that way you start working with a, your set of workable codes and something that you are more familiar with especially in terms of analysis. Again, it's an optional challenge. If you do it uh, great, please submit. If not, don't worry about it. Right. Try to look for alternatives or like just how you manipulate things in something else. That is possibly a little more easier to write code in to automate. So, uh, when you look at these buggy images online, uh, Hassan had a number of different floods to process, right? So you don't want to click through things. <laughs> right? So as a researcher, that's what you're going to do. You're going to create a workflow 
that does something and you're going to want to automate it. This is not to say that you cannot survive by clicking through, but it can be pretty painful. So this is just to motivate you to start thinking about it. And I haven't done it, but ImageJ does have, like you can do Python extension. You can definitely create plugins in C, uh, like code that you uh, C, Java, C++, that you uh, compile and add as a plugin. I haven't gone through that process, but it's a possibility. And I think it can be interactive with Python, but I need to actually myself go and work with that a little, because I think that's sort of an ex exciting opportunity. And it's exciting opportunity because, well, Python was not done for 3D visualization. This requires 3D visualization. Not even in ImageJ, 3D visualization is uh, always great. But at, in terms of walking through stack, it's great. But an actual 3D that rotates in 3D with different views, it's okay, but it's not the best. Um, I have recently found that Python ha works with Mayavi, which is a great visualizer, very effective one and can be combined, and then it's okay, then it's good. Otherwise, Python in itself, 3D visualizations. <laughs> 2D, fine, 2D is, and 2D with the, all of the web applications has been kind of, it went through the roof in terms of what you can do. But in these cases, you need three-dimensional <laughs> objects, and they're, they're difficult because they're difficult to rotate and change the views because they're porous media, especially, it's like, it's a, obscure three-dimensional object. Uh, so how you um, go through it is important. Okay. Everybody completed exercise three? Well, we have five minutes left. Um, I'm not going to then start um, new. How about you start working on this exercise two for five minutes and then we'll, or we can dismiss. Since I typically go over, I'm completely okay dismissing the class five minutes early. <laughs> I've probably already cost you the <laughs> five minutes before. Or you can just start working on exercise. I'm going to stop the video though.